Let me just give you guys a couple of my tips when I'm talking to people about how to communicate. You want to give us a couple of tips on, as we actually record this? <laughs> Are we not recording? Theoretically, we're supposed to be taking a break. <laughs> oh. It's all making the guests comfortable so that they feel safe and then they get all the good outtakes out of their mouth and they can't take it back. <laughs> yeah, that's our marketing secret. Welcome to the What's Your Baseline podcast. In this show, we talk about our experiences and lessons learned in enterprise architecture and business process management. What's Your Baseline is designed to be for everyone. Newbies who are just getting started with these topics, organizations who want to improve their EA and BPM groups and the value they get from it, as well as practitioners who want to get a different perspective and care about the discipline. Each episode will tackle different key topics, providing context, background, best practices, and stories from the road, inviting you to learn from our challenges and successes, and demonstrating key tools to help you set up your practice and get the most out of it. I'm your host, Roland Wold, and I'm joined today by my co-host, J.M. Erlinson. Hey, J.M., how are you doing today? Not too bad, Roland. It's uh, it's a beautiful day today. It's, I mean, I can't believe it. It seems like yesterday it was winter and it was literally snowing. And today, boom, <laughs> the sun's out and it's nice and warm. I'm going to go for a walk later. I am so ready for it. I'm 100% on your side. But Jam, we do have a premiere today. Really? You know a premiere? Yeah. Oh, we wow. Do. Yes. <laughs> we do have, obviously, fitting to the new season, uh, we do have a new guest today, which is no surprise, but it's our first female guest that we have on the show. So, wow, it JM, took us, uh, <laughs> it took us three seasons to introduce you <laughs> to Laurie Kelly, who's uh, impressed with that burden that's now on her shoulder. Well, hello, Laurie. How you doing? Uh, hello. I didn't realize how monumental this was going to be for everybody. <laughs> I'm, yeah, glad, uh, I'm glad to play the woman card here. There you go. And, and it will get better over the course of the next hour. No worries. I, I, I think what we're looking for is the expertise card. I, I, it, it just, it's wonderful that you're female. It's, it's wonderful we get representation in architecture and process. I feel like that's something we see a lot in sort of the demographics of people we work with and people we see in the field. And I'm, I think that's been shifting over the past little while. But I, there's a, lo a lot more to do. So now we just can argue about what the female version of the word nerd is, but I don't want to go down that path. <laughs> Oh, gosh, please save me. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, save I, everybody I will, else. <laughs> I will save you if, as best I can. Lori, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast. We've had a chance to chat in the back, and that's, you know, that's a, it's been a really fun time just discussing who you are and your whole life. But I'd love to tell that to our audience because uh, you've had a fascinating experience to get you to where you are today and a lot of lessons along the way to share. So first and foremost, Lori, tell us about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Thanks, JM. Um, so I, for purposes of this call, I am in marketing. Um, my real life, I'm a mom with two teenagers and a puppy. So um, I balance that with my, with everything I do with work. So I've been in marketing for 25 years. Um, I guess you could really say it's marketing and sales because mm. for all of it, it's been bridging the gap between those two industries. So I'm a huge proponent of marketing and sales alignment. I spent most of my career at PricewaterhouseCoopers um, in marketing sales roles and most recently led a billion dollar practice unit. So Ooh. did a lot of, well, both sides, right? The executive aspect and then also managing all the markets. Um, and more recently, I've transitioned to technology and in within that more enterprise architecture. So um, it's been a fun, a fun road. And I feel like I've been able to apply both sides of my career with like consulting and, and to technology and vice versa. And I think really applies to enterprise architecture and the conversation we're going to have today about value. Yeah, which is obviously a very interesting question, because as the title of this show says, it's hard to communicate the value of enterprise architecture or architecture work in general. So we're happy to have you on board today um, talking about the value topic and, and what do you make out of it. But before we get this, can you talk a little bit about what you've done in the past, what might be key experiences, what made you choose enterprise architecture as a field for your professional progress? So as I mentioned, I've done a lot in a lot of different industries, lots of different size companies too, small, large, medium. Um, as I kind of just mentioned, I've been in publishing. So all the way down on, you know, drafting and writing articles and working with advertisers at advertising agencies, consulting all the way from selling commodities to selling specific professional services and software and SaaS. So mm -hmm. 
with that, that viewpoint, I have, a, I've been in a few different roles in each of these organizations. Um, I have a good perspective, I think, on how decisions are made. Um, and also where that execution falters. I have a huge passion for driving best practices. And with that, I've really been able to apply, like, how do you manage stakeholders, field new ideas? How do you take that into build and grow your footprint and revenue? So for me in the past, those were some of the, the key areas that I think really drive the viewpoint and what we're going to have a conversation on today. Yeah, interesting. It sounds like sales might might be a a, a cool bridge into marketing because I, I feel like it's, it's kind of doing the same thing, but with a different perspective and a different part of the process. I, I know that our, our marketing, you know, the folks that I work with in marketing are, are really closely connected to sales in the sense that they they're both trying to pitch something, um, and they're both trying to activate the channels that they know. They both have a portfolio that they're able to offer, um, but they sort of approach it from a different perspective. Just can you? Can you speak a bit, a bit, a bit of a difference on how a salesperson might see, the, you know, pitching value versus somebody in marketing might see pitching value? Well, so what I would say is there's more commonalities than anything. Um, and one of the things, if you go to like marketing 101 class, you'll hear about like the awareness funnel where you start. This, this is like the stages of what a prospect would go through from where they're first introduced to your company or actually where they're first introduced to the pain point the responses to the pain point, then um, you get, you use like, you know, things like white papers to get them interested or blogs, or you're out at events doing presentations. And then sales, once that person is engaged somehow on that pain point, they can understand that, yeah, I I think I want to fix this pain point. Then marketing has enough, um, should have enough interaction with that person to be able to hand it over to sales, where sales can now take that pain point and help co-develop a solution. And maybe, Uh, hopefully, that solution is your product, but that's not, in sales, you wanna win, but at the end of the day, it's all about relationships, right? right. So if -hmm. you're establishing relationships and having conversations that are really helping the the person on the other end, um, that to me, at the end of the day, is going to create a lot of success for everyone involved. So um, Hmm. it kind of goes down to that age old, I don't know, mantra that you you work with people you like. Yeah, it's like always, you know, it boils down to the people, as we said on this podcast many, <laughs> many, many times. Uh, yeah, oh, but yeah. Before we get to this, uh, A, Laura, you avoided my question. What brought you to the uh, nerdism <laughs> of enterprise architecture, which is still unusual. So I'd like to have an answer on that. Okay. And I also like to uh, like our listeners to get you to know a little bit better. So what are your bucket list items, your hobbies, your interests, these type of things. And you have the choice which of the two questions you want to answer first. (laughs) I'm going to go to nerdism first. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because that's the nerd in me. Um, uh, Well, so the way I came to enterprise architecture is coming um, from PricewaterhouseCoopers, spent a lot of time with companies and talking about value propositions, how companies, you know, really how they hire consultants to always fix a problem, right? Or help them accelerate um, a solution or the research, they want that extra bit of credibility, right? From that consultants provide for how to run your business better. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. But what I saw a lot on my PwC side is obviously the rise and importance of digital transformation. When I was there in the beginning parts of it, everyone talked about it like it was this new great thing, which was to me, I think we can all sit here and laugh about it because it was like, we're putting in a transformation plan and it's going to be done in five years (laughs) or (laughs) this is where we want to be by 2020 or whatever year it was. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is the digital transformation is going to happen. Well, lo and behold, I think with all your conversations, all my conversations, right? Um, it's a journey. It's then the milestone keeps or the, the goalpost keeps moving, right? So I wanted to get closer um, into technology and understand what was really designing and fueling the opportunities. And so enterprise architecture naturally is where I think a lot of that happens. And the more I got into the industry and certainly like the products and tools that are available. I realized too how many companies are trying to create tools to do this or just the fact that it's very difficult 
to really say where you're on the journey, how to prioritize, et cetera. So to me, I always want to get closer, closer mm-hmm. to the outcome. And I think that's what really drove me in enterprise architecture. So there you have it. Huh. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's how other people, I mean, I'm not the technologist. I'm not um, mm-hmm. certified in TOGAF. I'm not, um, I don't have idle, um, uh, you know, licenses or whatever you call it. I'm just, I'm much more business speak, right? Mm-hmm. And wanting to get the most out of what we have. From a bucket list perspective, um, I've, Someday, I think probably most people like love to travel, um, would love to get to Asia. I really want to immerse myself in that culture. Mm. And then as far as like what I really love to do, um, I sit in my backyard and have fire pits with great friends, our kids and the dogs. So <laughs> that's um, that's my type of fun. Yeah, well, I I, I got to tell you, I, I, I'm a little jealous. We don't have a fire pit or a backyard where I'm from. We live in a box in the sky, which is uh, <laughs> it's oh, it's all kind of living. fun. But yeah, apartment life is a little. You, you don't have quite as many cookouts uh, when you're when you're in downtown Toronto like I am. So well, I, I'm I'm envious, and it seems like a, a lot of fun. And in, in terms of going to Asia, I cannot more strongly recommend it. It's beautiful. It's it's rich, full of culture, and unbelievable food. So uh, I I. If you ever need recommendations on where to go to Japan, I have lots of lots of great ideas on that. Well, with that said, I I, I wanted to get us into our topic for today. We've already started the conversation a little bit, um, but I know that a lot of folks uh, out there, a lot of our listeners really struggle. Uh, they struggle to justify why EA matters. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who who was like, EA is just a cost center. How how can I possibly justify spending more on a cost center? All I want to do is cut a cost center, right? That's what we're always taught to do. How, first and foremost, tell us, how do you start the conversation around the value that enterprise architecture can bring to an organization? What's your, what's your first starting point for that conversation? Well, first, I just want to say I can relate to that. Marketing is considered a cost center. So there's a, there's some somewhat similarities Ooh, yeah. in, in that. You know, we're spending money in marketing. So um, in enterprise architecture, um, I, I can relate. So it really comes down to how you communicate value. So one of the, I think what you just asked me is like, what is the first thing you need to do? And to me, I think with anyone, right, it comes all the way down to any kind of project we've ever started with kids or, you know, however old we are, you need to define your goal. Right. So I think the it's really important to understand the vision of where you want to get. So if you, if the value is where you're trying to, obviously we all want to communicate value. I think everybody and everything we do in life, we want to communicate value, except, you know, if there's even with love, you know, you love friendship, you know, raising kids or, you know, relationships, there's always this value, like you share, right? There's always this, like, I like someone and you have like a, an informal uh, greeting where like you're sharing ideas together and enjoying that. That's value, right? But if I think about enterprise architecture and I think about like, we need to think about what we want to accomplish. So I'm going to go back to like Wikipedia for a moment, because I really wanted everyone to define and and hear what the common definition of enterprise architecture is. I know there can be a lot of people, a lot of different discussions on it. But so this is what Wikipedia says. Enterprise architecture is an analytical discipline that provides methods to comprehensively define, organize, standardize, and document an organization structure and interrelationships in terms of certain critical business domains like physical, organization, technical. Characterizing the entity under analysis. (laughs) There's more to this, guys. The goal of EA is to create an effective representation of the business enterprise that may be used at all levels of stewardship to guide, optimize, and transform the business as it responds to real-world conditions. EA serves to capture the relationships and interactions between domain elements as described by their processes, functions, applications, events, data, and employed technologies. So the reason I say this, number one, it's a pretty huge um, definition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I wonder how many people have actually even read that uh, sort of definition, have that common terminology with, when they're either A, working with or B, deciding on how EA is to be seen in an organization. And therein lies part of, well, 
the there's a couple different issues with that. One, lots of different definitions. I think they have some commonalities, but it's such a large charter that yeah. if you think about what you're trying to accomplish and you think about what value you're trying to give, it would be almost impossible for anyone. I mean, you guys are enterprise architects to a degree that when do you feel like you can put the pencil down? There isn't, you know, and that's the beauty of it, but also the challenge when you're talking about value. And it's also quite a mouthful, right? So if you have to explain to your, to stick with your example, to your significant other, what your uh, benefits are, and you have a five minute spiel on that, I think you, you missed the boat, right? Uh, what I see is, yes, you do have people who do architecture for a living, but they're always in competition, Right. They're always, when you look at projects, you know, somebody comes up, obviously the term architect is not whatever protected in any form or fashion. Mm -hmm. So they come up and say, oh, I'm the Salesforce architect or I'm the so-and-so architect. And they're just technical folks who uh, implement a certain software. So I, I think the discipline of EA struggles with that. Uh, because there is no whatever a common core or no common understanding in there. Yeah. So Lori, when you, when you start to talk about this, what do you boil it down to? Like when you're trying to make these sorts of things uh, accessible, how do you make enterprise architecture first and foremost simple to understand so that you can start to talk about value? What do you say? I heard someone say once that enterprise architecture is about assessing and prioritizing digital assets. Hmm. Which Just I think it's a little bit too short, but let's go with it. Well, right. So as the architect would say, that's not exactly <laughs> all. But if, you, if you're going for something simple, that's a direction, I guess. And I mm -hmm. think just in general, we overcomplicate it. And you just kind of mentioned that, JM, right? And mm -hmm. Roland. Um, and getting back to the basics, I, I just want to say a couple great things, though, about EA that we, we made be challenged sometimes with communicating our value sometimes but it's it's so important um, in today's modern economy digital transformation is increasing the demand for ea and dedicated ea roles if you were going to look on linkedin and just do like a little analysis on the job openings for enterprise architects it's increased five to eight percent in mm -hmm. the last two, like year two years and what i thought was really even if that, that doesn't get you money in your pocket. The other thing is Glassdoor, um, which ranks these jobs and all the jobs that are in highest demand across the country and the world. Enterprise architect is the number one job in the U.S. and U.K. in 2022. Yeah, that's really too. crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. And, and that's the funny thing about it. We had a conversation with Carlisle Gunn a little bit like last season about how there are very few direct training programs called enterprise architecture in, in, yeah. a, in a, a university level at a college level. And so mm -hmm. it might be the number one job, but it isn't the number one degree. So mm -hmm. at some point in time in your career, something is happening to turn what you know into the shape of what enterprise architecture is. People are thinking and finding value in their own approach to enterprise architecture. Well, now we want to talk about how to bring more people into the fold. So w w once you once you got a little bit of like your goals, what you're trying to accomplish, how do you take that message out? I think, OK, so we know there's value. Yeah, uh, we know we need to simplify how we communicate it. We know companies need the job. I think the next thing you think about after you define the what is the who uh, it's the mm. audience. Right. And that goes with any kind of advertising marketing messaging if you think about like just very basics of going to market it's the who what when where why right so we've done the what now we're going to the who so i'm trying to think about ourselves as enterprise architects into who we're talking to so i think it's really important to understand how today's business is managed within this context um over the last decade ea's mission and ability to execute um its core vision is highly dependent upon organizational structure you guys are feeling this every day, different um, people you're working with in projects, agile teams, all these different teams that, you know, need or want access. Mm -hmm. The stresses of digital business have only accelerated this fundamental demographic shift. 
and technology resources and ownership, right? The old certainties where you have processes and governance structures put in place, which I think is probably what Roland was trying to say. <laughs> and my definition was too simple. He's like, ah, oh, you miss governance and process. <laughs> um, it just, it's not absolute anymore. So now EA needs to understand um, how to exist within this new paradigm with, and without the risk of being left behind. So what does that mean, right? Um, I'm trying to get to that who. Um, I'm going to take you to a fact real quickly um, as I get to this who, and I hopefully am leading the witness to the answer here as you're following along oh, with yeah. me. Um, Gartner reported that while 10% of roles in the organizations they canvass were traditional IT roles that report to the CIO, 41% were so-called business technologists. Oh, so wow. that means the day-to-day of these um, business technologists revolves around using and building technology, yet guess where they sit outside of IT. Hmm. So this is a fundamental issue, I think, for all of enterprise architects um, and the IT department, right? So the stakeholders don't sit in IT for the large part anymore. Yeah, You've got, um, yeah, so that I think is this, this, decentralized decision making is transforming how businesses are are get going to market because speed is uber important right speed as we notice with covid um we notice with like growth as we, in this capitalist society that we live in speed has overtaken the need for bureaucracy just to close out the loop on that that means you need to have a lot of different people that you're speaking with um to talk about who to have that value discussion with but, but I think this is not a bad thing per se. No. Right. I think uh, having ivory towers, and I literally have seen that at clients where they had EA groups and they did their thing and they couldn't communicate the value and they just all got fired. But when I looked at the artifacts that they did, that was actually good work. Right. So I think this just changes. And, and I think the state of business is always in flux. So I think when we move on, everything will become more agile, lowercase a, right? More agile in doing things. And that also means organizational structures that we have will change. You know, I, I don't think the example that you gave that 41% are not located in IT is a bad thing. I Quite the opposite. I think it's a good thing, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it makes it even more important to understand what are all those little juggling balls that you have in the air so that you don't drop one, right? And then you see the technology components where everything becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, microservices and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, There are even more juggling balls in the air. And I think this is the, the big shift that we see. And the question for me is, how does EA as a discipline, how do enterprise architects as practitioners adapt to those changes? Hmm. First, I want to say I totally agree with you. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It's reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're, gonna, you're already hinting at some of the things I'm, I want to talk more about. And that really is the audience. That comes down to the who. So if you have an artifact, right, just to jump on what you said a second ago, Roland, that artifact needs to be relevant to that person or to that team that you're talking to. And that disconnect is where we've got to, as a discipline, just really make sure we're serving up the right information at the right time. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I think about how, right, and this is probably if we could, we could all make a lot of money if we could bucket this or package this into a candy bar or something, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yeah, I, I love it. EA for your mouth. (laughs) <laughs> chocolate no it's like it's like the snickers ad you know you're not yourself yes. when you're hungry <laughs> that's right that's right i love it um you know so if we if we keep along this line of thought distributed decision making is driving change right and how ea's pursuit perceived um practiced managed we know frameworks are useful um but going back to what i just mentioned before it's only useful if others can consume it mm-hmm. um Another, just to add another quote to this fascinating conversation, because I think some of these research points that I've been able to gather up, I keep them on the side of my, you know, workspace because they're so powerful to me when I think about how you create value. So um, the CI role, CIO role in part, um, perhaps has lost its monopoly on technology. If you think about, you know, what I just said, the 41% sitting outside of IT. Yeah, there's no perhaps anymore. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> Gar- so get on the boat. Um, mm-hmm. Gartner says significant spending on digital initiatives and technologies is now coming from the business. Yeah, we just talked about that. Product teams led by product managers from the business um, are becoming increasingly popular. And Gartner goes so far as to say the IT organization has lost control of digital. Yep. Hmm. So when we think about how, like this comes back to the how do you communicate value, right? It's determined by those that surround you and who you're talking to. So think about in the broader terms, not just the charter, but how it's consumed by all the different um, audiences that we're working with. Yeah, I actually want to talk about this a little bit because we struggle with this. um, Roland and I struggle, I'm sure, Roland, as much as I, with this happening all the time. We seem to think that well, the business stakeholders are oftentimes buyers and champions that in doing so, they circumvent traditional routes of governance and um, in ensuring that the architecture that they are building is part of the landscape in a, in a fashion that is sustainable and secure. And I feel like sometimes marketing almost contributes on purpose to shadow IT. Because they know that the buyers don't exist within traditional structures. And if they can get them to circumvent those structures, they can get us, they can help to entrap them in Uh, some ways in a sale outside of those conventional and restrictive channels. Yeah, but um, I think you have an assumption here. And then I let Laurie speak. I think you have the assumption here that a hierarchical, centralized model of governance is the only way to create value. And I wholeheartedly disagree with that. You know, there's there's a, a spectrum of you have the command and control, the CIO decides what has to be done IT-wise and everybody else has to shut up to complete chaos on the other side. Everybody does what they want. Yeah, I'm looking but to avoid the complete chaos side. <laughs> I, I think there is, there is a middle ground, you know, federated governance models and all these type of things, the Spotify org model and, and all those things that I think become more important over time. But I don't want to hijack Lori's answer here. So, <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm digesting what, first of all, the entrapment thing got me, JM, because I think what you're saying <laughs> is that marketing and sales, uh, so two different things, marketing and sales you're suggesting when you're in a sales process is going around typical governance issues. Like if there's a buyer for a product, maybe it's an uh, CIO, maybe it's another person, the C-suite, who knows, who owns the budget. We're going to go surround that person and meet as many of those people as we can, right? So that we get to the CIO, is that, or the whomever it is. Is that what you mean by entrapment first? So when I, when I say entrapment, <laughs> I mean like the traditional like crime of entrapment, where you try and get somebody to do an illegal act where they wouldn't necessarily have done an illegal act, right? Let's take a look at this from an enterprise architecture and purchase a, a, a technology purchase perspective. You're looking at business take who would normally have gone through maybe talking to like an ARB or going through and having like these, you know, conversations about an enterprise context of software. If they're interested enough, if they're if they're brought in enough into a buying cycle through marketing, through sales, they might instead choose to make credit card purchases at trade shows. They might choose to go online and, and you know, subscribe to a SaaS you know, service product um, that would maybe be outside of the normal buying and governance cycles of an organization. They're making decisions to create shadow IT, and it's driven by better understanding of platforms and technologies. It's driven by the good things, but it's causing them to do things that in you know, as Roland said, traditional, you know, hierarchical driven value structures would be considered outside of the acceptable. Yeah. So let's take me, for instance, if I see a tool in marketing that's going to help my business, um, I have a budget. And if my, if I can, I will buy it. And sometimes you have a credit card, you put it on. um, And then I let my IT person, well, usually I'll let my IT person know that I want to buy something. Um, but that's more I care about it from an implementation perspective, not from a meta model architecture perspective. Right. So, um, yeah, no, I can see and that goes for any business unit. Right. And that's where we get to this 41 percent HR or it goes to the markets or um, other centers or business units that are buying technology. There's the, how many like how many tech software technologies are there in the world today? I mean, I can't uh, even 3.75 gazillion. 
<laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> An exact and number I, from Roland. <laughs> You know, sitting on the other shoes, I'm targeted or I'm communicated on all these tools. Like a marketing is in the last 10 years has become a whole new buying center. So I have to experience <laughs> what I put out in the world right back at me. Right. So um, but I do. Again, it gives a different viewpoint, I suppose, on how you purchase IT. Yeah. So so I just want to help wrap up the conversation. So we're, we're still we're, we're still in the how phase, though. So how so. We talked about the who, getting the right stakeholders. We, talk, we talked about the you know what we're trying to accomplish. Of course, our first step of of, of defining things uh, and and having a goal in mind. And let's let's just cap off the how. So the see how do you reach people in this in this capacity? How do you win over hearts and minds uh, about creating value with EA? About looking to you know reinvest and refocus and give you know the right seat at the table to voices from enterprise architects. So I'll give a few couple tips here. By no means should this be considered exhaustive, but I will say talking in simple statements in words that people use that you're talking to really helps solidify your message. So the real depth of technology and what EAs are doing every day or architects or even IT, right? Um, if you're talking artifacts, if you're talking all these different depths of knowledge, it's not going to resonate perhaps with someone who sits outside of IT. So when you talk about value to the business unit, talk to them in the business unit that they're working in, marketing, HR, operations. If you're talking with IT, then use your terminology. But these simple value statements need to be like one sentence that you could write down and repeat over and over again. Like, for instance, what is your, you could define what enterprise architecture does. Like um, JM, my view of enterprise architecture is I'm helping the organization to digitally advance our assets in the most effective and most economical way. So that is something you could repeat over and over to people and do that because the more you're evangelizing, not only you and your role, but the discipline. And that is what's sharing value across the company. Number two, I'll say relationship building is so important, right? Um, just like the way we're talking right now, we can have conversations. We could even have quote offline conversations about challenges or things we're running into in a very casual way. So by the time you go back to, um, ex anyone else you're talking to about value, you can, you can relate to them in a certain way. So to me, the relationship building and understanding exactly where the pains are really helps so that you can attach solution to pain. And that is value. Um, so I think also just one thing I'll say, cause I think, it, um, Roland, you and I have laughed about this in the past, not really laughed, but I know we've talked about it, that EAs can be seen as the people who say no, mm -hmm. um, when you really want to be the people that say, I know how to help, not no, I don't know how, I can't help you. Yeah. So it's that facilitation that's so important, whether it's in written emails or it's, it's just your tone, the way you're talking in meetings, that um, the helpful nature of communicating your value really lets people see the positives in it. If it's always negative or if you're not finishing your sentences or you're assuming people will know the value it's not, it, it's not, it's not communicated. So those are some of the things I would mention there. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I just saw a, a little meme the other day <clears throat> that shows the differences between marketing in Germany and the US, you know, <laughs> on, at the example of a fork, you know, and the German marketing would say, oh, it's a uh, super high tech steel that the fork was made of. And the tips are super, whatever, fine grounded. And it's super plated Purpose with built. whatever. <laughs> And uh, the American marketing is uh, lets you eat your food 30% faster. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, I think, and I think this is exactly the problem that EA runs into it because you get lost in the details. It is important that your fork has those wonderful tips and it's made out of super duper uh, good steel. But at the end of the day, you need to have the benefit being communicated. I love what we've been having a conversation about so far, Laura. This is great. I want to take a quick break to have people digest the first half of what we're talking about today. And as we're going at the break, uh, we're going to play a little bit of music. And over the music, I would encourage our audience to think about a couple of different things. So first and foremost, 
put it all in the context of your services and capabilities. If you're an architect, if you're a business stakeholder, if you're anyone who provides services and capabilities, what are your goals in raising the profile of what you offer? Um, who are you communicating what you do to? And how can you make what you do easy to understand and help show the value? We'll leave you for a moment and we'll be back with our second section. Welcome back. Um, this was a great bunch of information that we heard from Laurie in the first segment of this show. And I can promise you it's getting better in the second half. Um, but just to recap it, we spoke about EA as the discipline and the many, many attempts of things that EA wants to do and how difficult it is if you don't have a clear message, right? So uh, Laurie introduced the concept of the what the who and the how, you know, what do you want to communicate? Who do you communicate to and how do you communicate? But uh, just to bring us back in, Lori, why does that matter? I think it matters for everything we've been talking about so far, right? I mean, it, I hate to say it, but EA can have a reputation for being extremely technical <laughs> and some people just can't <laughs> really follow along with some of those, uh, those words and those terminologies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I can tell you as a business unit stakeholder, I think data quality is a huge, huge, huge issue. And um, that if companies don't get right, it's just a very slippery slope for everybody downstream in the business units. For instance, I care about that because I want to make cases for investment. I need to know if my technology is bringing in the right ROI. I need to know if my uh, KPIs are not meeting the right number. I need to make sure I, those KPIs are accurate, number one, mm -hmm. and that I can show effectiveness off of that. So I really care about data quality. So that's one of the things e enterprise architects at the end of the day Why does it matter? It matters to the rest of the organization because we have to be able to make decisions on quality data so that we can work together better and grow the business. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and we spoke about this on the podcast multiple times that there's a shift in how you do decision making, right? On the business side, with the uh, advancement of process mining, you know, where you now don't have to go into workshops and listen to SMEs and whatever their preference is, uh, You're now looking at data. You actually see what users do, right? And that takes the subjectivity out of the conversation. And I think this gains uh, acceptance. The question is, how does it go into other areas of the architecture, right? And I think there's some, whatever, neglectance there because the many, many of the organizations I work with don't have, for example, a central repository where you find stuff. You know, they try to build this with ServiceNow, another software, which is not truly an EA software, but all those different things. But I, I think when we, when we talk about architects, how can they enhance their perceived value, right? If, if the data is not there or the data is currently being built. You just said perceived value, right? So we've been talking about value all, all up until now, but now mm -hmm. we're adding this perceived value, which is really important because we can think we're all individually helping others, you know, do their work better, which in theory is considered value, but it's really on how they think that perceived value is of what you're giving them. So it's one of the easiest ways to do this um, as an enterprise architect, as anyone within a business is put yourself in the other shoes. So use the language that other people understand, right? If you're talking to CFOs, they want to know about revenue growth, cost savings. What is it that you're doing in enterprise architecture that's going to enable that? Mm -hmm. If you're talking to COOs, you, they want to know about efficiency and effectiveness. Talk about how you're able to drive a faster time to market, speed to value. You know, that's what people, and C, CISOs, you know, they want to know about security threats. There's so much of what enterprise architecture does that hits every single person part of you know the organization but we need to articulate it to them in their words 
Yeah, it sounds like one of the first pieces of the puzzle is doing that sort of stakeholder analysis. I mean, you, you talked about this before about the who, but now let's talk about like segmenting down a stakeholder and their needs and saying, mm-hmm. hey, I'm going to have to have a communications plan for each of these different people that I need to gain consensus with. I need to get a coalition of people on board with the value that I'm creating. So I need the CSO to hear this. I need the COO to hear this. And all of the words you're saying are the same core message, but you're just reframing them for each person to maximize its value to them and maximize their interest in it. I love that. I think that's really, that's a great takeaway for everyone. And it's not just about marketing, you know, enterprise architecture. I feel like that's a, that's just a marketing anything. Uh, Right. Um, So another thing, so that's, Framing it in their words, number one. But number two, another simple tactic when you think about perceived value, uh, you kind of just did it with me, JM, um, is you listen to what I said and then paraphrase it. You took it a step further. But I was able to nod my head. You guys can't see it on the podcast. As you were, re- <laughs> as you were paraphrasing what I said, I said, he understands what I'm saying. So that is a very simple thing to do just in frame of conversations with people. Y- you want to make sure that when you're having the conversation, you say, yes, JM, I think what I, I heard you say is X, Y, Z. Um, did I get that right? And JM might say, yes, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And I need this. Right. So you're going to get that active listening and you're going to get that. So I call that paraphrasing, paraphrasing and summarizing back to them what you heard. I mean, obviously you don't want to do it for everything you say, but it's a great way to get the other person on the other end uh, to know that you're listening to them and you're hearing what they're saying. Yeah, and it's a soft way of creating authority without having authority. Yes, I say influence without authority, yeah. So do you have any tips uh, that you can give people to uh, improve on that stance, you know, to say, okay, how do I do this? I'm, I'm uh, at the bottom of the totem pole, but I have that very important thing that I, that I want to communicate and get out. How, how do I uh, do this? Well, number one, I think you need to know you have something important to share. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> no, like honestly, that sounds Believe kind yourself, of funny right? to say that, but like as you're going through your work list or you're going through all the work that you're doing day by day and you're thinking about the projects you're trying, there's always this element of buy in, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, every time I'm doing a project, I'm having little one on ones. And this, I've, I've talked to other enterprise architects when they're creating a meta model. They need to get a lot of feedback from a lot of different stakeholders. Those one on one conversations. Um, where you're paraphrasing, listening to them in their own language, you're making sure they, and you're following up with an email. I heard you say these three things. This is important to you in the meta model. You're mm-hmm. taking, you're, you're like the captain of your ship, right? You need to let people know that you've heard them, you've articulated, and you're bringing it into the product. So number one, you need to know when and how to, that you have something important to share. So the one-on-one conversations to me, are where you can appeal to their, you know, self-interest. You know, we just talked about what's important to COO or what's important to um, a director in marketing or, you know, an HR. You can ask questions that are leading, for instance, like um, uh, HR director, I know you're challenged with how long recs are open. Um, is it, uh, could it be technology um, that's hurting you because you don't have the right information? So if you ask these leading questions, you're going to get, it, you're being an investigator, right? Um, another thing that's always great is like, do a deal, right? Say HR director, if I can help you reduce that time, those KPIs, is this something you might be able to talk to, you know, help me on the back end as I come back to you with certain questions, just know that I'm trying to reduce that, um, that lag time and I'll buy you a drink, you know, not a drink, but like, I'll take you to lunch or we'll go, we'll, you know, do something. Um, I think that deal or doing someone a favor really creates this personal relationship where you want the other person to succeed. So um, those are just some of the ways I go about getting higher perceived value because it's a lot of it t- times it comes down to psychology 101. If people invest their ideas, anything, ideas, time, money, effort, they feel a part of the outcome. So, but it's up to the person to take that perceived value and make sure you come back to it and communicate it back to them that you're doing what you what you've tried to um, that you've agreed to, agreed upon. 
Yeah, that, that's putting the power both both in the people's hands, but also responsibility in their hands. I mean, if you want to say that communicating your value requires individual action, requires that you take it a, a responsibility for the fate of, of your discipline, uh, the, the fate of, of the way in which your department works. I get that. That's that's a lot for people to hear. And also, you know, folks on the line, I understand that's a lot for you to hear. You have to take responsibility for this. But this is part of what, you know, being a professional is, is taking the opportunity to communicate up your value and taking the opportunity to spread around the good word of what you believe in, because that's important in an organization, particularly if you, you know, we, we, there's, a, there's a great expression, the best idea wins, right? Particularly if you, if you have a good idea, maybe you may even have the best idea. If nobody hears about it, it's not going anywhere. Or if you make it by yourself, then it's still not as strong. It's like that diversity in teams, right? Because yeah. a diverse team c- creates a stronger outcome. An idea that starts as a great idea becomes better. And you, you, you can get rid of roadblocks, right? Or any objections that might be coming down the path because you've talked to people one-on-one and built it into your idea. So by the time you present it, you've already nipped those in the bud, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And, you know, in in terms of presenting that idea, one thing I want to ask you is about uh, how to do that. What channels can you activate to actually make that idea and in its presentation get to the right ears? I feel like a lot of people are in lower or mid middle parts of an organization who don't understand what pathways they have to receptive and influential ears. What do we do? So, J.M., I think the question you're asking me is what channels are most useful? Um, I think it comes back to the earlier conversation we had around distributed decision making. So EAs need to understand what channels they do have, right, to exchange that value. Um, We think about traditional EA teams really being focused on governing or exerting control over technology. But with these cross-functional fusion teams, it becomes a little bit more difficult because there's people in all these... um, specific uh, um, subject matters expertise, right, that are creating these teams. And in fact, it, it's kind of fascinating, too. I'm going to I'm going to um, quote another Gartner quote, because, again, this is one of the quotes I keep on the side of my desk. By 2025, 75 percent of an organization's architecture will be democratized across the organization with little or no central control. So, oh. yeah, Um I say that because we have to understand, again, the world in which we're living in. So if we want this perceived value to come through, we have to understand the channel. The channel is now a lot of these fusion teams. So if this so then I think it comes down to if EA is no longer the gatekeeper, per se, of technology resources. And to Roland's point earlier, shadow IT builds. Mm -hmm. um, There's a fundamental need to make informed decisions. So. That's another layer, right? We talk about how people are doing it. We've given tips, but now we need to talk about where. So you need to meet them where they talk. Um, I talked about right. the one-on-ones being extremely useful. You know, um, you need, and then if you can't get to someone, <laughs> talk to the people that you might know surrounding them. Test different ideas, right? So even if you're um, with these fusion teams, right? Let's like the new product team, right? These. Um, uh, teams that are trying to, to create something, go to market and drive revenue 10%, attach into one person, become interested in a very, uh, what's the right way, authentic way about the outcome. Ask those leading questions. Is there something that, you know, from an IT perspective, if this sunset, would this impact this? Or have you thought about this um, perspective? Because if you can get to that and get in that way, all of a sudden you're making them, the other person, the owner, um, the owner of the outcome. Therefore, they become part of the, the conversation just by intrinsically responding. But the key is to find out what's happening on that team or, or really how to get the information to them when they need it. That's a little bit more difficult. Um, yeah, but it, it sounds yeah. like when you bring these people into bear, first and foremost, you're getting informed opinions from a bunch of different perspectives. So you're starting to see the coalition around that person or that that business group that allowed them to have the power to make these sorts of decisions. And secondly, is is you're sort of battle testing your ideas, right? Mm-hmm. So you're you're it, it sounds like that you know that's what you're you're talking a lot about. And battle testing battle tested ideas tend to perform better because they've had the ability to be objected to by a lot of different voices. And so by the time they get to the person who needs to actually make the call, 
then it's a much better chance that they'll have fewer reasons to object, fewer things that they're going to find, fewer holes in your story that you're telling. I like that a lot. So, so w- when is this important? Let, let's talk about like the you know the, the process of communicating value, the process of you know marketing the the, the services and, and technologies, um, and building that coalition. When do we do this? I put on that lens of what will this look like at the end of the day, and so what? Why will this matter? So is that, then I start poking holes at everything I've created, right? Or even as an EA, like poke holes at yourself so that in the beginning, you can shape your outcome based on that. Um, so to me, it's when an idea is forming that you need to get buy-in and support. When I think about broader enterprise architecture, I want to come back to the impact of distributed decision-making, something that I think is somewhat fascinating. And I've been having some sparring conversations within my own company is, if we reinvented enterprise architecture today, I think it was, it was fascinating. We'd all consider a few different things that than how we have been doing it. So for enterprise architects, when you think about when do we need to communicate, think about these three questions. Um, EAs, we need to take the application to the data, not the data to the application, right? You think about mm. the teams that are out there. They need to understand what they're using Um and so it's, it's a flip-flop, right? Or if you think about the citizen user of enterprise architecture, you need to have a user interface and in how you're presenting your ideas that's designed for the citizen user rather than the technical practitioner. That is a big one, right? You think about that. Um, or in addition, enterprise architects function as fac- facilitators instead of gatekeepers of data. So when I think about... And I like the three points that you just made, but how can an architect um, support this? You know, what what would be uh, tools that help an architect to make that clear? So number one, I think it's somewhat difficult to pinpoint, but you people need access to the information that enterprise architecture is creating at different times for varying reasons. So one answer Mm -hmm. I have to that is you need a tool with an easy interface and has accessibility that it becomes a true company. What I would quote, say an encyclopedia, maybe people don't want to call it that, but to be able to access what you need in real time. Um, Right. And just a side um, note on this, our doc has been really been focusing on this topic and has has just launched, I think, like yesterday. Uh, What's today? Wednesday? Yeah, yesterday we launched a new um, tool called our doc discover. Um, And what it really attempts to do is to serve up this right information at the right time. It's a much lighter interface. It's a Google like um, bar where you can search either by um, constraints or you can just say, you know, what data runs on um, blank server. So uh, there's a different, there's different ways and you have to think about the consumption, right? Of mm-hmm. how people are consuming the data. And if you take away the guardrails of these really technical detailed tools, but provide it to people in a way that's easy to understand, easy to get the information out of, easy to see the correlation, then people can consume it and truly democratize it. So that's something um, that's just come out and I think um, will transform the industry, actually, from what I've seen. Yeah. And, and having said that multiple times on the on the podcast, we're obviously an equal opportunity podcast, right? So there are other mm-hmm. tools out there. But that sounds really interesting because I, I think getting over the hurdle of access and getting quick access to information that then help decision makers understand why you recommend A, B, or C, I think that's a pretty critical point. And in most organizations that I look, they, they do not have a repository at all. And I think that also allows for tailored perspectives, right? We, we, we access the, you know, the information from different people, different stakeholders, different viewpoints, different need sets, but it's the same information. Just as you talked about before, the message tailored to different people. It's, you know, when you have a repository driven information system, that same data can be segmented out by different stakeholders. So it's one of those cook once and serve many's. Everyone gets a little bit of, a little bit of the meal, depending on what they need at the time they need it. I, I love that. So then I have a couple questions for you. We'll take them in order. Um, the first one is how do enterprise architects internally 
promote the brand of what they do, promote the value of EA, you know, promote up inside the organization and grow. And the second question I'll have is how would marketing ideally like to use enterprise architects, their knowledge, background, experience, and skills to be able to support the efforts in promoting it outside of the organization to showcase how powerful what they do in that company is? Okay, let's go with the first question was how EAs yeah. can um, increase their effectiveness and how they're sharing value. Um, yeah. One number one, I think about your personal brand. I, I, and I, I say that because I, I'm probably expecting there's a lot of eye rolls happening right now. <laughs> um, because this is not something that was that I'm coming up with, but it is something that's so important in today's world, right? You need to think about do I want to be helpful? Do I want to be a, a, a person that's a um, people reach out to to uh, spar on ideas? Do I want to be a facilitator? Those are all things that are driving and enhancing the reason why people would want to come to you. Um, I think it's really important to have um, when you're talking to people internally, not to have these deep technical terms. Uh, that would maybe a challenge for some people because you're so used to speaking your technology language, but it's really important to step out and talk to people that way. Yeah. EAs, I think, can tend to be a little righteous <laughs> because that's been their <laughs> really? role for so yeah. long. They're governing data. They're the police force right around this. But it's it can't be that way in a living, breathing organization where there's, again, this distributed decision making. So um, it's it's having this uh, continual idea of wanting to make a better product and a continual ideas and iterations make it better. So have that, have that perspective when you're talking to people. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of your question, I think talks around how can, um, how can EAs support marketing, I suppose. Yeah. Um, number one, I think it comes back to your social networking too. You, um, LinkedIn um, is a really useful tool for everybody in business, you know, and one thing I think EAs sometimes may not do is kind of coming back to that. Um, people will find me if they need me. No, mm -hmm. you go out and connect with your network. You connect with people that you've met internally, externally across the industry and really do your, I guess, brand, um, what I would say morning routine, get out there and like, and share, um, I'm saying that to myself too, because I don't know that that's something everybody does um, all the time. So that's always a good thing to do to help marketing. Um, and I would say, keep the elevator pitch of what EA is simple to you. Um, so you can frame it to people and a, a way that you could always, if someone ever asks you questions about it, to, uh, think about a story, how you might be able to share how EA has helped a company or your company or something you've done or a project you've worked on. So you have a couple little nuggets. If someone comes in and says, okay, JM, what do you do? Or Roland, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You can say, you know, I'm helping the company to prioritize digital assets, you know, using architecture. And one of the things I'm really proud of is we've been able to reduce time to market on XYZ product because we knew how to implement a new technology that would support certain capabilities. Yeah, make it relatable through like stories. Yeah. And I, I think stories are probably our most powerful, you know, our most powerful communication tool when it comes to showing a mirrored universe where they could get that same value if they simply, you know, followed the approach that you did. I, that's that's fine. I, I love that. And having those old war stories under our belts is something that I, I do a lot, particularly in solution engineering. But I, I know that I, I, I talk to a lot of people who just say, well, here's what I do today. Here's what I'm working on. And that that's certainly not letting people know what the future might be. That's simply saying what today is. But it's also a thing that, at least in my observation, and you might disagree, that architects are more introverts. Yeah. Right? So they they like to work on their details and all that wonderful stuff. But they they, like we said before, they did not build up the skills to communicate their ideas in an effective way. So, Laurie, maybe to summarize this segment from, from your perspective, what would be your, say, three, four, five tips that you would give uh, one of those introverted uh, architects, besides obviously going on LinkedIn, which I highly recommend <laughs> to do as well, um, what would be your tips to, to these type of personalities to become more effective? 
Well, I talked about having an open mind. I think that's pretty easy, you know, just really moving beyond um, away from saying no to really always making room for improvement, Mm -hmm. Um, move away from the guardian mentality to the facilitator of knowledge. So that open mind. Um, I think when you're talking to other people outside of the architect world, right. And this is really what we're talking about, right. We're not talking within enterprise architecture. Um, We're talking outside that perceived value, that 30,000 foot view um, taking what you're doing in technology and what it means to the operations of the business, what it means to, KPIs or investment opportunities, um, that speaking that language, that 30,000 foot view and attaching what you're doing to the rest of the organization is always going to make your role more relevant to other people. So Mm. I think that's really important. And I see that in EA that we don't talk like that as much as we should. So that's, that would help us just in a long way, just to connect what we're doing to the business operations. Right. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'd say, and there, I said a whole lot, and so hopefully it's not the, I'm not just saying these are the three things, but one last thing I want to say, because it's so easy, um, is to have fun and smile. And I know it's kind of funny to say this, <laughs> but we're smiling while we're talking right now, right? Yes, we are. Mm-hmm. I have worked long enough where I've had a couple of people say to me over the years, or I said to many other people, don't take our role so seriously or righteously, right? Um, we're all here to make a living, but at the same time, we want to feel productive. We want to enjoy who we're working with. So trust the process, you know, smile, joke around, have fun. People enjoy working um, with people they like. Um, Mm -hmm. So that likability factor really is something to consider when you think about if you want to be with a company for five, 10, 15 years, that really doesn't happen as much as it used to, but um, <laughs> you have a lot of relationships to build and having fun and smiling along the way is one of the ways you can do it. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. Uh, but it is about time to have another break in our podcast. So before we uh, listen to another piece of Jeremy's really good music, um, I want to send you into our little break with a little call for action. So, Just think about what have you done, dear listener, uh, to promote your ideas and your brand? You know, what were situations where you succeeded or failed in communicating your ideas? And what might be ideas that you took from Laurie that you will try to include in your future communications? We're going to leave you alone for a couple of seconds and then we'll continue with the third segment. Lately I've been feeling that. All right, folks, thank you so much for giving a little bit of thought to how you promoted your ideas, your brand, and all the things you can take from this wonderful conversation with Lori, um, who has been uh, a really good. Thank you so much for for coming on and, and helping to share some of these best practices. I think that we can take this forward, you know, not just our listeners, but I'm, I'm personally going to take a lot forward from this conversation to be able to talk a little bit more about what I do and what, what why what I do matters and what value that it can provide to the organization and to the industry. So thank you so much for being here and, and bringing that perspective. Yeah, and also thank you from my side. But I think the most urgent question that I think everybody who's listening to this podcast has now is, how can I reach out to this awesome lady who has those great ideas to state the obvious? <laughs> um, you can reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Lori Kelly, uh, L-A-U-R-I-E, last name Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. Uh, we'd love to connect with all of you and help you ask any questions, uh, you know, spar, let's get it going. Yeah, and we will definitely put a link into the show notes so that people just have to click on it and get into contact with you. Thank you, guys. It's been a a pleasure sparring with you guys over the last little bit here. (laughs) 
And that's uh, a little bit more about our, our show notes. And of course, friends, that means it's about time that we call it for this podcast. Now, a huge shout out to all of you for listening, liking, loving, subscribing, sharing, all the good things. Please continue to do so. And of course, as Ryan Roland mentioned, you can find lots of information at whatsyourbaseline.com or the notes for this specific episode, including the transcript and all the links at whatsyourbaseline.com slash episode 26. Well, <laughs> as always, friends, I've been J.M. Erlinson. I'm Laurie Kelly. I'm Roland Volt. We will see you in the next one.